Now we need to turn our attention to the topic of polarity. Uh, now in Gen Chem, we taught you the difference between ionic bonds and covalent bonds. We told you that ionic bonds was the complete transfer of electrons and covalent bonds were the sharing of electrons. Uh, we even addressed the issue of polar covalent bonds here, which got on our list, um, where there was a difference in electronegativity between the atoms. Uh, so I want to remind you of that here. So, and if we look at difference in electronegativity, that actually is what's going to determine whether a bond is nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, or ionic. Uh, back in Gen Chem, we might have just simply told you that, you know, if you've got a metal and a nonmetal, like NaCl, so that's going to be ionic. And if you've got two nonmetals, uh, that's going to be covalent. So it turns out we want to get a little more stringent with our definition here. So it turns out if the difference in electronegativity between two atoms is less than 0.5, like if you've got two identical atoms, like a carbon-carbon bond, well, carbon's got an electronegativity here on the Pauli scale of 2.5, and 2.5 versus 2.5 obviously is a, a difference of zero, and that is definitely a nonpolar covalent bond. So two identical atoms typically leads to a nonpolar covalent bond. Uh, but we might take this a step further, and you should definitely realize for organic chemistry purposes that a carbon-hydrogen bond is also nonpolar. So if you look at carbon and hydrogen here, it's 2.5 versus 2.1, and that's only a difference of 0.4, and that also falls in the nonpolar covalent range. So we'll treat both carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds as being nonpolar covalent. Uh, from there, we can go to polar covalent, and you might look at, say, like a carbon nitrogen bond. You see this is right at the cusp of being polar. So carbon's 2.5, nitrogen's 3.0. That's a difference of 0.5 and we consider that polar right at the border. So a little more polar than that is the carbon oxygen single bond. So in carbon oxygen here, 2.5 versus 3.5, a difference of 1.0. And if we take this even a step further, carbon fluorine. So here again, 2.5 versus 4.0. It's at 1.5 a little bit more and it would have been considered ionic. And finally, if we look at that NaCl again like we did, uh, sodium's 0.9, chlorine is 3.0, and that's a difference of 2.1 greater than 1.7. That's definitely ionic. But you'll also find some examples uh, that might have fit your Gen Chem criteria of being ionic. So, like, say you've got a carbon magnesium bond, and we'll see these uh, in second semester. A carbon magnesium bond, 2.5 versus 1.2, and that right there is a difference of 1.3. And if you notice, we've got a metal magnesium, a nonmetal carbon. But being less than a difference of 1.7, this would be considered a polar covalent bond, not an ionic bond. So the idea that metal and non-metal is ionic and two non-metals is covalent, there are definitely numerous exceptions. It's a great rule of thumb for Gen Chem purposes, but definitely numerous exceptions. Um, we don't expect you to memorize, obviously, all these electronegativities and stuff like that, uh, but we will reference them time and again throughout the semester. And while we're talking about polarity here, we should definitely talk about what's called the dipole moment. So symbolize the letter, Greek letter mu here. Uh, and it turns out it's the multiplication, the product of the partial charges of the two atoms uh, times the distance of separation. That gets you a dipole moment. Uh, in this case, it's measured in units of what we call Debye's with a capital D. We'll see some of those units down here on some of these molecules. So, and the units are not this most important thing, but you should realize that a higher dipole moment means a more polar molecule. So if we're looking at molecules then and deciding if they're polar or nonpolar, the first thing I'm going to do is just look at any bond polarities, any polar bonds that it might have. So we look at the first example on the far left here, methane here. If you recall carbon and hydrogen, that is not a polar bond. And so since this molecule has no polar bonds, right off the bat, it's going to be nonpolar. And if it's nonpolar, it has a dipole moment of zero. If we go on to chloromethane here, chloromethane, the carbon chlorine bond is definitely polar. Again, carbon 2.5, chlorine 3.0, that's a polar bond. And we often draw these bond dipoles. So starting with a little plus charge towards the partially positive carbon, the less electronegative atom, and then the arrow goes towards the more electronegative atom. So in this case, partially positive on the carbon, partially negative on the chlorine, and that is the only polar bond in this molecule. So as a result, then this overall molecule has a bond dipole pointing that same direction. Now, if we took a look at dichloromethane, it's got two polar bonds, two carbon-chlorine bonds, one with a bond dipole pointing that way, one with a bond dipole pointing that way. And when you've got multiple polar bonds, you've kind of got to look at their vector sum. And so in this case, if you add those two, uh, they're 109.5 degrees apart. And the average, if you take the vector sum of those two, it goes right down the middle between them here. So, and there's your overall bond dipole in blue. Now, if you look here, they're 109.5 degrees apart. And so they're more than 90 degrees apart, and so they're more canceling each other out than they are adding to each other. And that's why your bond dipole for dichloromethane at 1.6 Debye here is lower than chloromethane at 1.87 Debye. If we move on to trichloromethane, or chloroform as it's uh, commonly called, we've got three polar bonds, three carbon-chlorine bonds, all 109.5 degrees apart. 
And in this case, they're all canceling each other out to a degree, but they're all additive in some way, shape, or form as well. And if we look right down the middle of this molecule, right in between all of them, is the vector sum of those three, and that's the overall molecular dipole. So and in this case, they're canceling each other out more than they're adding, and that's why your, your bond dipole moment here is, I'm sorry, your mole molecule dipole moment here is even smaller at 1.01 Dubai. And finally, when you go to carbon tetrachloride here, you've got four polar bonds. And when you take the vector sum in this case, all pointing 109.5 degrees apart, they all cancel. So the vector sum is zero, and so you end up with a nonpolar molecule with an overall dipole moment of zero. Now there's one other thing we should address here, and that's the difference between a, a single bond and a double or triple bond. So if I looked at a carbon-oxygen single bond, we can do calculations of dipole moments for single bonds or just an individual bond rather than a molecule as well. And for a carbon-oxygen single bond, it turns out it's 0.7 to buy. But for a carbon-oxygen double bond, it is significantly larger, more than three times larger at 2.4 Dubai. And we've got to explain that. So and it turns out when you've got a double bond, you've got a sigma and a pi bond. And it turns out pi electrons are much more polarizable uh, than the electrons in a sigma bond here. And as a result, being much more polarizable, you get a greatly increased dipole moment associated with a carbon-oxygen double bond as compared to a carbon-oxygen single bond. You might see something similar if you were to investigate like a carbon-nitrogen triple bond versus a carbon-nitrogen single bond as well. So just one last little tidbit I wanted to throw in there.